All right. Lord, again, we come to you. We ask for your guidance about your word. You designed this word. You put into it a unbelievable amount of information packed into uh, an amazingly small number of verses filled with information there. And um, so we ask for your interpretation by the Holy Spirit tonight as we continue uh, getting towards the end of the book of Daniel. Enlighten us uh, and edify us. And, and help us apply all these principles and all these things uh, to our own lives so that we can become more and more like you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay. Now, you should have your outline there. And we are finishing up the last part of Daniel 11. So it's taken us, it will take us three weeks to... Um, complete this because there's so much information in it. Now, we start in verse 36, so let's look at, let's read 36 through 39 and take that first. And again, you're going to see here, I think, a switch, a change. He says, then the king will do as he pleases, and he will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will speak monstrous things against the God of gods, and he will prosper until the indignation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. And he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers, or for the desire of women, nor will he show regard for any other god, for he will magnify himself above them all. But instead, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god whom his fathers did not know. He will honor him with gold and silver and costly uh, stones and treasures. And he will take action against the strongest of fortresses with the help of a foreign god. He will give great honor to those who acknowledge him, and he will cause them to rule over the many and will parcel out land for price. Okay. Now, let's try to take this apart a little bit. First of all, in verse 36, notice the then. It implies a break. It's a break in time. And, of course, the transition is between everything that's been discussed prior about Antiochus, Epiphanies, and and you know his uh, efforts, his actions. We went through all this history, including him, uh, his father, his intrigues, his manipulations, his bribery, his military strategies. All these things, of course, we talked about in the previous week, and you're going to notice. Here, as we as we've gone on, and we're seeing these verses now, that this can't possibly describe Antiochus. All right, and so let's note how it can't describe Antiochus. Okay, so like I said, other information which we're going to look at will will prove this. The scope, remember, of this vision given by the angel. Go back to chapter ten, verse fourteen. The angel, who's not named, remember, comes, and he gives a vision, and that's what we've been studying that we call chapter 11, this vision. And he showed Daniel these things. And, of course, he says this is a vision that applies to the latter days. That's what the angel says in 1014. So we know that's the scope, ultimately, of this. Now, also... Uh, we see here that uh, it's going to introduce someone new, and, and uh, that's what we're going to look at. Now, notice that he's called the king, okay? Then the king. He doesn't describe a king of the north or a king of the south, does he? He says the king. Uh, and we remember when we were back how many maybe it could even be months ago now, <laughs> in Daniel chapter 7, verse 24, that uh, Daniel seven twenty four, 
told us about Antichrist. It alluded to him. Literally, Antichrist is the last king of the earth prior to the real king of the earth, that is the king of kings, arrives to put an end to this all. Okay? The era of normal earth history will conclude. That doesn't mean there won't be another section of earth history, but it won't be the same kind of earth history. It'll be a very different earth history, the millennium. Okay? But that will conclude the era that we're in of what we call, if you want to call it normal, normal earth history. Okay? Now, notes here in... Uh, it says that he does as he pleases. This describes the level of absolute arrogance of this person. And, of course, it says that he'll exalt himself above any other god. Now, this also proves that it cannot be talking about Antiochus. Because remember, when Antiochus went into the temple and committed the abomination of desolation and spilled all the pig's blood all over, okay, then what did he set up in there? Mm -hmm. Right. He didn't set himself up in there. Right. He set up an image of the Greek god system that he worshipped. Mm -hmm. That's what he set up in there. So clearly this can't be Antiochus. This has to be speaking of someone else, because Antiochus did worship the Greek god system. Also notice, and probably it's worth us turning here to remember, uh, this rather famous verse. Go to um, move from Daniel, mark your place there, and go over the New Testament to 2 Thessalonians 2. It speaks of two events which apparently end up being linked in time fairly closely, though we don't know how closely exactly. Starting verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians 2, he says, Let no one in any way deceive you, Paul says, for it, and we're going to see what it is, for it will not come until the apostasy comes first. The apostasy, literally a falling away from the faith, the traditional faith of Christianity and all its basic tenets, which certainly I think we're seeing in spades today. Then it says in verse, uh, it goes on and says, and the man of lawlessness, that's what Antichrist is described as, the man of lawlessness, is revealed, the son of destruction. And of course, when we see what happens in the last seven years uh, of the book of Revelation, that period, he certainly, particularly the last three and a half, is sure the son of destruction, who opposes every, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So this will mark the ultimate abomination of desolation, the final abomination of desolation. Now, remember what has been the goal of Satan all along. Go back to Isaiah 14. Remember the fall of Satan in Isaiah 14? The I wills. Okay, he goes through the five I wills. Do you, you want to turn there? Do you want to look at it? Let's go back and look at it for a second. Let's go back to Isaiah 14 so we're clear about this. This is the record in the Scripture of Satan's rebellion. And we're going to look at... Uh, uh, starting, we're going to look at verses 13 and 14 of Isaiah 14. He says, uh, You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. The word stars there does not mean the things you look at at night. Okay, It's the word that means angelic beings. 
okay? So he's saying, I will raise my throne above all these other guys, the other angels. I'll become the ultimate angel. Of course, he was as Lucifer, uh, and but he becomes uh, the, the head of the group. And, of course, we know what he does with part, part of them or what happens to them. Then he says, I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And then the next statement, I will make myself like the Most High. So the goal of Satan all along has been to supplant his creator and to put himself in the position of naming himself as God. All right? This is exactly, of course, what his uh, inspired figure, okay, we know, as a matter of fact, that Antichrist becomes indwelt by Satan, and this inspired figure indwelt by Satan, this is why he does what he does. This is why he goes in the temple and says, I'm it. You have now seen your God, all right? Unbelievable arrogance, you know? He certainly highly underestimates God. He will figure out rather quickly it's a very big mistake also. But he was there in heaven. I know. Did he miss it? Because it, it, it's, it's like, you know, some distortions become so embedded that you get to a point where almost there's no return. Yeah. Okay? In which... You can't reason, you can't point out, you can't, you know, nothing you can say once that point comes ever deters the person from what they ultimately, you know, again, we could talk about uh, some of the unbelievably incredible things about the political left and what they're saying in this country. You know, you, you, you look at they say and you go, it's just completely insane, but you can't reason with them. You know, they have committed themselves to a course that they clearly are not going to back down from. You know, they've endorsed it. They believe it. They're only going to listen to the voices that they listen to. They're only going to, you know, uh, the media only supports what the media wants the narrative to be. And that's it. You know, so on a human level, we see, I think, in a similar thing in this, too. So. Now, but that all comes from there, right? From Satan. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Now, back in Daniel, we see here, he says then, he talks about that he'll speak these monstrous things against God, and of course, he will he will prosper until the indignation is finished. Now, this is an interesting phrase. It's an interesting phrase because I think it's a double meaning. The word in Hebrew is the word zeam, and it means fierce anger, almost out of your mind angry. That's literally what it means. So it's, it says that, that this indignation is finished uh, to in, in the process of addressing several things. First, I think it describes the original angry, jealous rebellion of Lucifer. You know, you cannot imagine Lucifer without seeing intense anger. He is an angry, angry figure beyond, I think, any imagination. You know, this is... <coughs> So this is one thing. This is why Jesus, when he described Satan, what did he say of him in, in John 8? He says he's a, he's a father of lies, and he's a liar, thief, murderer. That was his description of, of Lucifer. He's a liar, he's a thief, and he's a murderer. This is his character. So anything that he touches and does, it's going to involve those things. He's going to distort and lie. He's going to steal in every imaginable way, ultimately the souls of human beings, Mm -hmm. you know, that go with him. And he's a murderer on multiple levels, you know. Go ahead. Honey, I I cut you off. 
I'm, all right. All right. Now, it's interesting um, that we see a second thing, I think, that's implied by this. And that is that this indignation also seems to speak of the Lord's indignation. Because remember, what does Jesus call the last three and a half years of the tribulation period? He calls it the great tribulation. And he says, if if he didn't come back to end it, there would literally be no life left on the earth. That's how bad it would be. So this is an unbelievable level of indignation. But, of course, what it will lead to, because it is time limited, the last part to three and a half years, and what will happen, of course, is that it will lead to Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan himself being bound. You might want to turn, well, we were in Isaiah, and maybe I should have had you Keep your hand there in Isaiah. Turn to uh, Isaiah 26. Back again to your left. Isaiah 26. We're going to look at verses 20 and 21. He says, Come, my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you and hide for a little while until indignation runs its course. For behold, the Lord is about to come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and the earth will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer uh, cover her slain. That's sure true of what happens in the book of Revelation. That certainly is a good description of that event that we call Armageddon, the battle or battles, probably more of Megiddo. That it, you know, what does it say about the level of blood that's going to occur in this valley? Because of right, right. it will it will be an unbelievable slaughter. And remember, for about two hundred miles, for about two hundred miles from the from the bottom all the way up to the very top of that valley. And remember, uh, it says he will come from Basra, speaking of Messiah, in Isaiah it says this, wearing a red robe. Mm -hmm. Why? Right, Mm -hmm. because he's coming to judge Antichrist's military forces and the armies of the world. He will slaughter them, okay? You know, and and that will end that part of Earth history as a result. Yes. Yes. <laughs> What's your question? Uh, um, you mentioned that Satan was very angry. So was he anger um, was it caused by jealousy? I think it was. Angry? Yes. Uh, yeah, he, he could. Couldn't, he, couldn't he could not accept being the creation, mm-hmm. but rather he had to insist mm-hmm. that he had to be the creator. But he keeps failing in that. He does. Right. No. Distort. Change. But he can, no. He has no power to create. Only God has the power to create. The word for creation, interestingly enough, in Genesis one one, where it says for God created, mm-hmm. is the word bara, and it means something which comes from nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Only God can do that. No one else can do it. Yeah. Yes. Norman. In relationship to the army that Antichrist or Satan will have at the time. Are the members of his army fallen angels? That's a good. I don't think they're fallen angels, but it be, it it brings up a good question, Norman. That if you go to Joel two, for instance, and there are some other sections, it talks about this army that overflows Israel 
that is in no way a conventional army. They, for instance, it talks about them jumping immediately to the top of a wall. It talks about them being in, unif in unison, where they never vary out of step from each other. I think it's, I think it's possibly uh, a hybrid army system, maybe an AI implant hybrid army system that he comes up with. There's going to be something very unusual. Now, what we're going to see as you go on here also is that there are other forces that come also to this valley of Megiddo. Okay, there will be his forces, but there's going to be other forces because it says that, that and we'll look at this in Revelation, that there are these evil spirits of war that draw all the nations of the military earth to this place. They start to gather around here in Syria, up from Egypt, up from North Africa, from the east, okay, and they start to move into or towards Israel. In regards to your answer, given the point about being able to leap mighty bounds uh, and these other armies that are coming in, from what I've been studying, it doesn't appear that they're what we would consider as human beings in this room. They, they don't look, or, or at least the language and the study, that they're, I don't know what you want to call them, aliens, but that's why I said fallen angels, because how else do you describe them? I think that they are, I think that they are hybrids, just like Satan in Genesis 6 developed hybrids yep. called the Nephilim and then the in the generations after the Gebrim, I think he's going to create more hybrids. That, that's my opinion, based on the transhumanist movement, based on the AI movement, you know. Um, that's kind of what they're working on now, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. They're not only working on it, they, they have made incredible advancements, and there's no longer any limitation on this technological these technological efforts like there used to be. There used to be limits. You could only do so much genetically, and there were supposedly international laws that said, well, that's just completely well, you gone. you think about the injections they want to do on people, you think they could control people that way at some point? Well, injections in what sense? The oh, the chips. Okay. Well, if let's put it this way. I think, you know, there's so many things they could do. You know, we know that there are nanorobots, apparently, that can be injected at this point into the bloodstream. They're talking about using them for medical technology purposes. But you could sure see all this technology. Yeah, there's something good you can do with it. But there's a whole lot of evil things you can do with it. So is this to take over the world or take over? Is that the whole behind it? I will be in charge. Okay. And this is what we're going to see as we go on. He, he ends up with complete dominance over the world uh, in a very real sense. Because, of course, why? Uh, because when Adam and Eve sinned, he got the title deed. And this is his plan over thousands of years is to bring it to this point that we call the seven-year tribulation period. He thinks it's the culmination of his plans, the enactment of his goals. Okay, And, of course, it, at first it looks like he wins. he wins, but <clears throat> I know that's the whole point. Yeah. It, it's it's an apparent win that becomes a major defeat, and that's what's going to happen again. All right, so verse 37, it says, and he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers, or for and it, well, let's take that first. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers. Now. This plus the next statement, also where he says, where uh, nor the desire of women are two very challenging statements to interpret. So different people have viewed them in some different ways. Uh, I'm going to give you a proposed interpretation of them. You, pr you pray about it, consider it, think about it, ask the Lord to show you, okay, if indeed it makes sense. Uh, now, obviously, again, verse 37 talks about, and he cannot talk about Antiochus. 
All right, it's talking about Antichrist. Now, Antiochus did show regard for the God of his fathers. Mm -hmm. With Zeus. With Zeus, with Mars, with, you know, Aphrodite, with the whole, you know, Venus, the whole pantheon of, of demigods, all right? But it says here that he won't. Now, the word here, interestingly enough, is he says the, go the gods of his fathers. Notice the plural. It's Elohim. It's not the God of his fathers. It's the gods of his fathers. All right? Okay, let me go on. Now, one possible view is this, and I encourage you to think of it from this standpoint. Whenever you see a difficult passage like this, I think one of the best ways to start to consider it and think about it is from a thematic standpoint. What are the themes? What are the movements? Just like we saw the theme of his rebellion and then the theme of the culmination of that being, of course, the abomination of desolation where Antichrist declares himself God in the temple. We see these repeated themes all the way through Scripture. So I want you to think thematically about this for a minute. Now, we know that Satan rebelled, and we know that a third of the angels rebelled with him. So a third of them are what we call the evil or fallen angels. Now, who was the first Antichrist figure in history? Nimrod. Nimrod. We find this in Genesis 10 and in Genesis 11. Now, in Genesis 10, 8, it makes this very enigmatic statement about Nimrod. It says that Nimrod became a Gibberim. It literally says that he became Chalal is the word. The word Chalal means to be corrupted. It means to be hybridized. It, it speaks of something where it starts out in an original form and it's changed into another form that it's never meant to be. That's what it means. Okay? Would that have to happen at birth? No, I think Satan is perfectly capable of doing this at any point in time. I think that in his case, he did this with Nimrod, right? right? So it says right there in, in that section in Genesis 10, 8, that he became a Gibberim, all right? He wasn't originally. Originally, he had normal human genetics, but he ends up not having normal human genetics. He ends up somehow being hybridized. How did that, that happen? We don't know how it happened. Okay? You know, you, uh, we're not told the process. We're just told the outcome. Yes? Yeah, I firmly believe God has everything that occurs. Does. How does he allow Nimrod and the things that we're looking at he lets it happen because he part is part of his plan and because he gave not only mankind free will but he clearly gave the angels free will too otherwise they could not Which all of them Yes. Yes, all of them had to because Right. Exactly. He was Lucifer. He was the he literally the word Lucifer means the morning star. He apparently led morning worship of God Almighty in the heavenlies. That was his job before he fell. Must have got a heck of an abscess. <laughs> So think about it. He goes from being the praise leader of God to what? Deciding he wants to be God so that everyone can praise him. So is that what we're seeing with the 
of 17 to 27 people on the Democratic. <laughs> Well, let's not let's not let's not go there exactly. So now, well, there's all yeah there's there are similarities. Okay, now it's of course we know that Nimrod had a tower built, and it says that it reached unto heaven. This again is not a very good English interpretation of the Hebrew. What it means in the Hebrew is it. it it accessed the heavenlies. Okay? Now, one of the ways that we can know this, there's a lot of ways, but one of the ways is because it was called the Tower of Babel, mm -hmm. and it was at the center of the city that he built called Babylon. Mm -hmm. And what does Babylon mean in the Aramaic? Confusion? No, it no. no. The gate of the gods. That's what it means, the gate of the gods. So how could you term it the gate of the gods without that being the process that he's trying to create there? All right, so, so he opens up a dimensional portal system on the top of this huge tower. And, of course, in Jewish literature, in many places in Jewish literature, it says that he what he built on the top of it was a massive zodiac system. He right there created astrology. Okay? Now what is astrology? Ast not astronomy, but astrology. What is it? You applying to what? To the stars, to the planets. Okay, now notice that the stars, particularly the most prominent ones, have names, mm -hmm. and they're associated with individuals, all right, mm -hmm. like Sirius. Mm -hmm. The star Sirius, okay, is associated with Nimrod's wife, Semiramis. Now, you go, hmm. Why is that? Well, think about it. In the Giza pyramids, the middle pyramid, the Great Pyramid, has this thing called the Queen's Chamber. It's this 10 by 10 inch uh, channel that goes from the Queen's Chamber out to the outside of the pyramid. And on spring, on the solstice, or, well, it's not quite on the solstice, actually, but in spring, or approximately March, if you stand in the Queen's Chamber on a particular day, you see right in the center of your view the star Sirius. And that was connected when, with their worship of Semiramis. So the stars, Venus, all these, Pluto, they're named after the demigods, the fallen angels. It's how they got worshipped. So the astrology system was a system set up for the worship of the fallen angel entities, okay? And, of course, you look at, you know, Babylonian mythology, you look at Indian mythology, you look at Sumerian myth uh, mythology, you look at Akkadian, you go, go anywhere you want to, and you'll see the same system. The names will be different because they're different languages, but the figures are the same. Yes. Okay, would it be correct to say then that God created astronomy? Well, in other words, astronomy is a science of learning the stars, the constellations, and all the things how God created it. So say then again, the story of his idea and created a story. Okay, and remember, back back to Genesis one. God sets up the times and the dates and the days, which his calendar system, which is, and in it, he also creates this thing called the Maseroth. What is the Maseroth? Remember, I've been through it. What's the Maseroth? It's the constellations, okay? And sometime we'll have to go through it again. But the constellations all have names, yeah, they talk like, for instance, you have the Virgin Virgo, okay? You have the King Leo, you have the Cross Crux, 
you have uh, you have Draco the dragon, and if you go clockwise, I think it is, on the Masroth, it tells a very interesting story that a virgin would have a child born who would end up, in other words, it, it's the gospel in the stars. The Masroth is the gospel in the stars. Hmm. Of course, people study this. Uh, we have uh, E.W. Bullinger, and uh, he certainly has written a, a famous book about it, de describing it to us. So, yeah, this was got. So before anything was written down, people could look and they could see the message about what God intended for the universe. Mm -hmm. Just all they do is look in the sky and see it. Corrupt. Yes. Yes. True. They are because they're they're using satanic information, okay, to try to gain information about the future or people. And of course, it's always deceptive. Yeah. This is why mediumship was absolutely prohibited in, in, in Deuteronomy 18 in the Bible, okay? It was absolutely forbidden to go to a medium and to do anything to do with astrology. Now, yeah, so, yeah, Saul really blew it on that one. So, Zeus, Apollos, Mars are the demigods, that is, the fallen angels or the hybrids of fallen angels and people, of this system. Now, even though Satan built the Zodiac system, it appears that he wants it ended. He isn't going to worship the gods of his fathers, but rather he's going to set up a new system. What's the new system? Yeah, it's all about him. Okay? So he ends up ending or putting down, or however you want to put it, the demigod worship system, so that he comes up with a direct worship system here at the mark, the three-and-a-half-year mark, where he goes into the temple, and of course it's all now. So Nimrod was the first Antichrist figure, and of course the final fulfillment is here uh, with Antichrist uh, at the three-and-a-half-year mark. So I'm throwing that out. You can consider that as a possible interpretation for that. Now let's go to the other part of it. It says, nor show regard for, uh, or nor for the desire of women. Now, several people have interpreted this a, a variety of ways. I'm not convinced exactly. It could mean multiple things. It could mean one thing. I'll throw out a couple possibilities for you. Number one, it could say that he simply has absolutely no respect for women. That is a possibility, okay? Number two, some people suggested that it, re it really means that he ends up as a figure who has same-sex attraction. All right, no, no desire for women. That's a possible interpretation. I, per I think it's a stretch. I think there's a better interpretation. And the reason why I think it is is because there's a very, very long centuries and centuries long tradition in Jewish literature that Jewish women would pray that they might be the woman through whom Messiah would be born. Okay? That's what he think he's really referring to. In other words, he hates that woman because who came from that woman? Jesus, Jesus who defeated him at the cross and through the resurrection. And I think that's why it says that he has no regard for those women. Okay. There's a very long tradition in, in Judaism, in Jewish literature, that they would pray that they might, each woman in their, her generation, might be the one through whom Messiah would be born. Okay? I mean, tradition was before Messiah. Or, or they yes. still, still the... Well, actually, probably both now because they don't believe they don't believe, they don't believe right. that, that Messiah's come yet. You see, where we know that he 
comes that it's it's his first and second. Okay, so basically, the idea is that he has no desire for regard for women because it's that woman being called Mary. Okay, who bore Messiah, who caused his demise ultimately, with Messiah being born into the earth. And of course, defeating him at the cross and resurrection. Yes. What is your opinion based on section F? And part of section E, it stipulates when you're talking about the desire for women of the same sex, all the types of uh, suggestions. And then we get down to the Jewish women. And the Jewish uh, now allow a woman to be a rabbi. Uh, well, that, that's real. There, there's one element of them that allows the liberal element of them. Okay. Liberal or right. Otherwise. Well, the, but still well, but in the I I think you'd find the Hasidics and other conservatives. There's just absolutely no love. no. There's no way they'd allow it because they're again, you know, they follow much more rigid. rigid uh, they fought, They try to follow the Mosaic law. They try to follow the Levitical system. And, of course, it wouldn't allow for a woman. There's no priest in that system that was a woman. Right? So, okay, now, verse 38. But instead he'll honor a god of fortresses, a god whom his fathers did not know. He will honor him with gold and silver and costly stones and treasures. Now, it says that, that as we, as believers, honor the Lord as our ma'az, or ma'az, okay, he's our fortress, he's our strength, that Antichrist will honor rather a military system of strength and a monetary system of power and influence. That will be his fortress. That's what he puts his his uh, faith into, okay? Obviously not putting it into the Lord God. Uh, hold your hand here in Daniel. Turn, if you want to, to Psalm 52. There's an interesting verse here, I think, in Psalm 52. Verse 7. Psalm 52, 7 says, Behold, the man who would not, not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches. Does this sound familiar to you, what we just read? Okay. And was strong in his evil desire. I think that does a good job of summing it up, doesn't it? This is what we're seeing here in this verse about Antichrist. It does, but it, but it fits it in the ultimate sense with Antichrist. He takes it to the, to the exponential power, you know. Now, it's interesting. The God of his fathers is a Jewish idiom. It's used over 70 times in the Old Testament, the God of his fathers. So it's implying a Jewish ancestral line. That's what I wondered. Yes. Again, if you remember... A few weeks ago, I talked to you about Antichrist, and I asked the question, which Norman, interestingly, answered before I could. <laughs> yes, you did. And I said, do you think that Antichrist is Jewish or Gentile? And, of course, you said both. You said both. And so I gave you the arguments for both. And, of course, one of the arguments for the Jewish side is through the tribe of Dan. Now, I'm not going to go through that all again, but you'll you'll find that uh, that's probably a way in which, indeed, he could have a, a Jewish element in his ancestral line. Well, I, I started to answer you Jewish when you made that comment just now. You were smarter two weeks ago then? Yeah. <laughs> it goes to your point here, both in E, F, and G, it would lead you to think that he's stronger on the Jewish side in the Gentile side, it, it, I don't know. Uh, you know, it, it, I think that there are so many implications, possibly, you know. 
you know, you, you, you ask yourself, why does he appeal to some level to the Jews? Because par until the three and a half year mark, apparently he does. All right. And there's indication in other scriptures that he actually ends up with some type of peace treaty. People believe, we'll see, that that peace treaty secures, quote, the peace of Israel in its land, which, of course, has been a constant problem since 1948. We've virtually never had any time in which Israel has been truly secure in its land. Uh, on the other hand, as we're going to see here, uh, well, let's go to H. Well, let me... Let me finish off one more statement, and that is that it, it says that he'll accumulate gold, silver, and treasures. Undoubtedly, this is to support his military budget because he ends up with a vast military system. Now look at verse 39. It says, and he will take action against the strongest of fortresses with the help of a foreign god. He will give great honor to those who acknowledge him. And he, and he will uh, cause them to rule over the many, which is always a reference of the Jews. It's always an idiom of the Jews, the many, okay? And will parcel out land for a price. Now, the, the word foreign god is the Hebrew word nekar, N-E-K-A-R. And it means strange or alien, and I think, again, is an implication of these demigods. They are the, possibly the foreign gods, all right? Because the, the language certainly allows a reasonable interpretation of that. So it means these fallen angel buddies of his may be aiding him in his vast military conquests. I think that's one way to interpret that verse. Now, this could also lead to uh, an authority uh, or control over Israel through a, we would call it today, a, a, uh, uh, I think they call it this two-state system, okay? In other words, what has been foisted on Israel for now years and years and years, a constant strategy for a Palestinian state inside the territorial area of Israel. This could also imply that he ends up betraying the Jews, although he appears to be their buddy at first. Remember, the, the, the whole playbook we have here is of Antiochus. Mm -hmm. the Jews buddy up to Antiochus. Yeah. He uses them until what? Until he betrays them. Mm -hmm. Here's the playbook. It's very possible this is the same thing with Antichrist. Some of them go with him. Some of them endorse him. Some of them think, well, this is the guy who will give us what we want until finally he turns on them and, of course, ends up doing something totally different. And that's, that's indeed what it could also mean in verse 39. Yes? In terms of uh, analogy under section H, thinking in terms of the Jewish world today and what Trump has done to put them in a position of strength that they haven't ever had. It's true. Does that imply from what you just said that Antichrist is on earth tonight? No. It doesn't necessarily imply that, I don't think. The prob See, the problem with asking that question because I no, 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 no. The, the, and this is a this is a very regular problem when people study prophecy. They'll say, "Who do you think Antichrist is? Do you think he's alive on Earth today? What do you think he's doing?" But you see, you got to go back to what we just read in Second Thessalonians. No one will know who he is until right. You can people can speculate all they want to, but they'll be deluded. Because the only thing that will make it clear is when he commits the abomination of desolation. That's when it says he's revealed. Because what already says there's been many in the Right. But. Now, before the ultimate one. Yes. Yeah, 
given that statement, does he have to be a human <laughs> nature? Is who we are? Well, who Jewish are? Okay, let's 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 ag- where he came from. Okay, you know, his prior. I mean, he's a third lieutenant to God, so the fallen angel. What does a duck look like if he does it? Okay, now remember, Antichrist is not. Antichrist is not a fallen angel. He is a being who at a point in time is indwelt by Satan. Okay? Now, no, they're not. Satan is his own entity. Antichrist, Satan takes Antichrist and makes him Antichrist. He takes this person, whoever he is, okay, whoever he is, he then endows him. Now, again, let's use the analogy here. What happens to Nimrod? He starts out being a genetically normal guy until until he's hybridized. Yeah, okay. I personally think that's what's going to happen with Antichrist. That's what perceived the question yeah. right there. That's why I asked. If we use the analogy, that would appear to be the, the final fruit of the analogy. He'll be trained up to be the and, and he'll be changed. So he could actually appear on the scene as a Hitler type. Or, or he could appear as the greatest peacemaker ever on the earth. He could, he could appear as being the greatest diplomat. See, he doesn't, he doesn't start out military, as you, as you read other passages. He doesn't start out military. He starts out political. He starts out governmental. Then eventually, once he gains complete control, then he becomes military. He's a dynamic leader that people want to follow. Oh, of course. Is that what happened in Venezuela right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like we've, said, like we've said many times, history may not repeat itself, but it sure does seem to rhyme. You know, Mark Twain, yes. Oh, the false prophet. Will he be the same type that you'll be an individual that will be? Well, no. I, I don't, I don't, well... It's hard to say with the false prophet. All we know is that he is empowered by Satan to do miraculous things. But is he indwelt? Is he indwelt? I don't know. Okay? He but he certainly is used very specifically. He's certainly a unique character in history. Um and uh and of course he ends up doing he ends up being the anti-Moses, if you want to put it that way, because he he does all these miraculous things. Okay, uh, I, I think that is a way, maybe a way to put him. So he'll be empowered. Yes, by by Satan. But is he changed? I don't know. Don't know. Okay, now let's go to verse forty. Hopefully, we're going to conclude this chapter tonight. It says. And at the end time, the king of the south will collide with him, and the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships, and he will enter countries and overflow them. Again, you've got to think who he is going to be now. He will enter countries and overflow them and pass through. Now, the king of the south and the king of the north, clearly in this context, is not talking about the Ptolemaic Empire and the Seleucid Empire. We're talking about some force in the future that's called the king of the south and the king of the north. Now, I think the implication here, if you can use the parallel of Antiochus and the Ptolemies, is it could be whatever political groups control Syria and control Egypt, since this was the Ptolemies and this was the Seleucids. But we don't, I don't think we can know yet who. I think we're going to see who. But I think we have to get closer to the end to know specifically who these characters are going to be. Again, this is the thing about prophecy. Some things you can only know them when it gets so close to the time that, that then they're revealed. You know, so I think that's the best we can know. But it says that he, Antichrist, will flow through these forces. Literally, the image here is like an unstoppable flood. 
they can't they can't successfully oppose him. Okay, verse 41. And he will also enter the beautiful land, and many countries will fall, but these will be rescued out of his hand, Edom, Moab, and the foremost of the sons of Ammon. Now this is a really interesting verse. Because you should ask yourself this question. Well, number one, what's the beautiful land? It's an image that's used over and over again. It's an idiom for Israel. It's called the beautiful land. And the jewel of that land, of course, would be Jerusalem and Mount, Mount Moriah, okay? So it says the Antichrist is going to enter into Israel like for a period of time, but he's not going to be able to completely control Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Why? I mean, this guy's controlling everything else. Why can't he control what is the ancient areas of Edom, Moab, uh, and Ammon? Well, I probably should have put a map up. I'm sorry. No, I probably should have put a map up for you to show you. But I'll, I'll just tell you, it is today the northern, east, and central, and southeastern part of the country today we call Jordan. That's the ancient territories of those three areas. So he's saying somehow he won't be able to control modern-day Jordan. Well, you sure pretty much can conclude that the Jordanian army is not going to keep him out. So what does it mean? Well, God put a protection on Jordan so the Israelites could flee there. See, there's my, there's my good student. <laughs> there's my good student again. I think that's exactly right. So let's go back now to this. Let's turn, turn to Matthew 24:16. Hold your place here, and Daniel, turn to Matthew twenty four sixteen. Well, let's we'll, we'll read fifteen and sixteen. Okay. Jesus is saying, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, and again, very interesting phrase. Next, which was spoken of through who? Okay. Daniel the prophet. Standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, okay? Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. In other words, the mountains to the east. Now notice how much he says and the emphasis of fleeing. And he says, and let him who is on the housetop not go down to get the things that are in his house. And let him who's in the field not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are in child and are nursing. It's a, in other words, he says, get out of town this second and go to the mountains of Jordan. And, of course, what do we know is in the mountains of Jordan? Petra, this natural fortress. Basra. Basra. This natural fortress that can hold hundreds of thousands of people uh, that has been used uh, to as, a, as an, a, an, a very impregnable fortress. Matter of fact, it's one of the few places, I've mentioned this before in the past, it's one of the few places that in, I think, um, about Junior, yeah, it's it's right. It's it's one of the few. I'll say it again. It's one of the few places uh, that when um, I forget which general it was, uh, he was sent by the Roman army. I can't remember his name exactly right now, but they sent him there. He he waged a series of battles against the people in Petra. He couldn't win because it's it's just it's it's you know it's it's these small narrow ways in or out you know then there's a vast inside but it's the access to it is extremely limited matter of fact he tried multiple times in multiple engagements to win finally went back to rome and then they assassinated him because <laughs> uh well let's put it this way there's going to be supernatural protection now how do we know that because in the book of Revelation, what does it say that Satan tried? The woman. 
the woman flees there, it says, okay, and the dragon comes after her. Uh, I think it's in, is it in 12 or 13? It's in 12, I think. Do you want to turn there? I didn't write that down, but I think it's in Revelation 12. Maybe we should go there. I probably should have put that in. Yeah, it's starting verse 1. It's talking about Israel. Uh, Revelation 12, 1. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a, a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and, and pain to give birth. Pretty clear, don't you think? Messiah is born from the woman, Israel. Okay. Verse 3, and another sign appeared in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, which of course is the way in which the kingdom of Antichrist is described in the, in the seventh chapter of Daniel. Okay? Having seven, he seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems, and his tail swept away a third of the heaven, uh, stars of heaven. This is where we learn that a third of the, heavenly, the angels fell with Satan. This is the verse where we learn that. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, the, the, he might devour her. How many times did Satan use people to try to kill Jesus when he was a child? Yeah. Until they finally had to flee to Egypt. Okay? And then it says, and, he gave, and she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is, is to rule the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up into God and, uh, and in, unto the throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she might be nourished for 1,260 days, which is three and a half years. Okay? And then you see, I think it's a little bit further. Maybe we should drop down. Uh, it says... Um, um, no, let's drop down to verse 13 of Revelation 12. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. So he starts his intense persecution of Israel. Remember, it says he invades the land, okay? And the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman in order that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, to her place where she was nourished for a time, times, and half time, again, three and a half years, from the presence of the serpent. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away with a flood. So he... Satan creates this, we don't know, huge downpour to try to literally fill up Petra with water to drown all the Jews, all right? And it says, and the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. Look at verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off, remember, went off, goes away, realizes this isn't working, I'm not going to win here, it goes off to make war with the rest of her offspring. Now, where are the rest of her offspring? Where's the two-thirds? In Israel. Okay? This is why the third here survive, and the other two-thirds don't survive. And they, okay? So, kind of pulls together a lot of different parts of prophecy, doesn't it? It does. Now, verses 42 and 43 of Daniel, let's go back to Daniel 11. We'll try to finish this off. Uh, it says, Then he will stretch out his hand against other countries, and the land of Egypt will not escape, and he will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and Libyans and Ethiopians will follow at his heels. Now, in other words, in the broadest sense, it says that 
that Egypt and North Africa will not escape his control. And he will loot them uh, from all their precious materials, like gold and silver, to feed his war machine. Again, Norman will tell you, knowing World War II history, this is exactly what Hitler did. He would go all through Europe and accumulate every beautiful drawing, money, gold, silver, great, you know, everything. And, of course, accumulated to try to, again, feed his war machine. Now, I want to propose an idea here, again, <laughs> for your consideration, okay? Now, here's what came to me as I was thinking, studying, and praying about this. I wonder if there's a hidden illusion here. Now, let's, know, let's look at what we know about the Ark of the Covenant. The last clear reference we have to the Ark of the Covenant is 2 Kings 23, verses 21 through 23. This is where Josiah orders it to be returned into the temple. After that reference, we have no biblical references of the Ark. You can't find any other reference after it. Okay. Now, you have... Yeah. Well, we'll see. Now, look... Okay. So let's go on and kind of go through this. Now, when the Babylonians invade in three waves, starting in 606, 605 B.C., we know from what it says they carry the vessels of the temple back to Babylon. And it, it talks about which ones. It talks about the silver, silver vessels, the bronze vessels, the gold vessels. It talks about the altar. It talks about all these things, the sh table of showbread. But what does it not mention? The ark. The ark. Mm -hmm. There's no mention that they took the ark back. Okay? Now, there's a provocative set of verses in a historical account. I'm not saying that I know this is true. I'm just going to cite it to you, okay? It's found in 2 Maccabees chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. 2 Maccabees is a historical record, okay? We know that. We certainly have good evidence of its historicity. But what it says in 2 Maccabees 2, 4 and 5, is that Jeremiah, the prophet, was told to take, by the Lord, to take the ark to Mount Nebo and bury it in a cave until, quote, a time when God himself will reveal it. Now, Nebo is an interesting place. Right? That's where Moses died in a very bizarre death because he had one of the few funerals, I would presume, in, in the world that the only person that attended it was God because no one else was there because God made certain no one else was there because he did not want anyone to know, especially the devil, where Moses' body was. And in Jude, of course, we know that. Well, if they had found that they would have worshipped Moses. Uh, possibly. That's true. That's possible. So, now, here are some other possibilities. We have a variety of scholarship and archaeology that's proposed several things. We have a lot of documents that indicate that the Ark could have been taken to Elephantine Island in Egypt. It's in the middle of the Nile. Uh, there are many, many documents written that claim that it was there for hundreds of years, but they also claim it was then later moved. It's clearly not in Elephantine Island now. There's no evidence of it being there. People have looked plenty, okay? We have a lot of documents that tell and historical records that say that it was moved from Elephantine Island, Egypt, to a church in Aksum, Ethiopia, North Africa. What are the two places where these precious things exist that Antichrist seeks? North Africa, Egypt, 
right? That's what's being talked about. Could it be that the ultimate treasure that Antichrist seeks for is the Ark of the Covenant? Well, we can it. I don't know that he'd need it, but I could see why he'd want it. Because what's supposed to be in the Holy of Holies? Okay? The Ark. The Ark. What completes the Day of Atonement? The Ark of the Covenant. What is the mercy seat? Where are the cherubim that look down on top of it? It, it is. Yeah, exactly. It is the central item inside the Holy of Holies. So again, for your consideration, but uh, it, 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 it's a provocative idea at least. Yes. What's what is in the Ark of the Covenant? Three, three things were originally in it. The Torah? No. Scrolls? No. The three things were in it were, were Aaron's rod that, that, that was used to do miracles, and it budded, etc. That's one thing that was in it. The second thing in it was, quote, a golden jar of manna, where God provided through manna as they went through the wilderness. And the third thing in it was the second copy, yeah. right. the second copy of the Ten Commandments. Why the second copy? Because what happened to the first copy? Moses, Moses came down and in fury at them worshiping the golden calf, he broke and he had to go back up and God had to give him a second copy. Okay? So those are the th things that at least were originally inside of it, that were put in it. Now, it says... Let's try to land this plane, okay? That's scary. I know. In verse 44, but rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him, Antichrist, and he will go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. Now, rumors from the east and north probably refer to the, the, the process that is initiated or found in Revelation 16, Okay? Why don't you, uh, why don't we go back there for a second? Because an event's going to occur that we find in Revelation 16. It's okay. Revelation 16. Yeah. And let's go to um, starting verse 12. Go outside. Okay, let's go on. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl upon the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that a way might be prepared for the kings of the east. Remember it says there'll be... Yeah, okay. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet... Three unclean spirits like frogs. I would presume, personally, these are probably very, very powerful demonic entities. That would be my... I think so. Because they're on the earth. Remember, Satan at this point, starting in chapter 12, we just read, he got thrown down to the earth. He can't get back up in heaven now. He's on the earth. Mm -hmm. Can't escape. Mm -hmm. Now think about it. The fallen angels come down to heaven. Okay? They come down to the earth, Enoch tells us. They, they cohabit with and create the Nephilim. What does God do with them? He takes them and sticks them underneath the earth in this special place called the abyss. Okay? And they're kept there until the end. Their, the Nephilim and the Gebrim's bodies die in the flood, and the, their angelic soul spirit gets trapped where? On the earth. Okay? And then, at the very end, Satan, after all of his mischief, God throws him down to the earth. And he spends his last years, before he's locked up, on the earth. He can't get back up into heaven. Okay? So, this is after that. That happens in chapter 12. This is after that. Sure. So, in, so I think that they're probably demonic entities. 
Okay, it's very, very powerful. But look what it says they do. Three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are spirits of demons. I think it's pretty clear, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the God Almighty. Therefore, do you see what happens? These demons are sent out. They stir up all the armies of the earth to come together to Armageddon. That's what happens. That's where they're gathered. And I think that's what's being said here in Daniel. So go back to Daniel 11. Uh, now, it's interesting how Antichrist returns from North Africa, angered that anyone would apparently oppose him. Uh, but the thing that apparently he can't see because of his arrogance is it isn't the armies from the east or the armies from the north that should worry him. There's another army that should worry him a whole lot more. What would that be? Messiah's army, who's going to come real quickly at this point, and that's the army that he should worry about. It's the Tassaba army. It's God with all of his angels coming as warriors to the earth to kick his butt. <laughs> to put it in the vernacular, that's true. All right, verse 45. And he will pitch the, uh, pitch the tents of his royal pavilion between the seas and the, beautiful, uh, and the beautiful holy mountain, yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. In other words, Antichrist's last stand is, quote, between the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea. Well, if you've been to Israel, what big valley exists between the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea? And Megiddo. Megiddo. It defines where the valley is by saying this, the Valley of Megiddo. It is, and it's a big, broad plain. You can look a long way either direction, can't you? Okay? So... Uh, it's also interesting, the Megiddo, I think, is interesting also because it's the historical highway between Egypt and Syria. This is where people traveled between those countries for centuries and centuries and centuries. So, he will then face his demise at the return of Christ in Revelation 19 by Messiah's army. And again, you can look if you want to, if you want to look at Daniel 7, 11, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, and Revelation 19, 11 through 20, which, of course, is the return of Christ to the earth. That's Revelation 19, 11 through 20. No one will help him means literally in the, in the Hebrew, there's no escape. This is it. This is his end. You know, God has now cornered him, has boxed him in. He's done. And, of course, the next thing that happens to him at, after the end of the of the battle at Armageddon, God takes him, takes Satan, takes the false prophet, and locks them for a thousand years in a prison that they cannot escape from. And they are in the timeout room. Okay? And this is why you'll see that the, the thousand-year reign of Christ in the earth doesn't have war because there's no one to cause war. So when you start to think about why all the wars occur, why all the this and that, think about who's the guy on top that's motivating everyone. There's still sin, though, right? There, there is still sin. It's more limited. It's more controlled. It's it, it's yeah, it's not fueled, though. He gets a good way to put it, Robert. It's not fueled by Satan, and therefore it can't go to the extremes that... That's why it says they'll take their 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 swords, spears, and turn them into plowshares and pruning hooks. There will be no war. Messiah will not allow war on the earth during a thousand years. So, I think we will next week complete... The book of Daniel, the 12th chapter, uh, I, I think so. I, I think we can do it in one part, 
And of course, we'll see the concluding comments about uh, one of the most beloved prophets of the Old Testament that we've been studying. So let's pray and end this. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the insights you give us into it. Uh, thank you for telling us all these things. We're, we're not without knowledge. If we study it, we can, it's an amazing amount of information about what's going to happen. Uh, but even though these can be scary or fearsome, fearsome uh, things in a way, ultimately we know that it's all appointed and controlled by you. Nothing's going to happen that you won't allow happening, and it won't go one nanosecond longer than you allow. So you're in control of history, and you're in control of the conclusion of history. And we thank you. You're going to bring it to an end, and that end is going to lead to justice and righteousness on the earth. So thank you for all these things. We pray tonight in your name. Amen. I have something I want to say to everybody. As you know.